Hello and welcome to Jeremy's Retro Bar. I'm Jeremy and this is my Retro Bar and it is Marchintosh, which means if you search hashtag Marchintosh here on YouTube or over on Twitter, you can find content related to the Mac. And I'm gonna talk about switching to the Mac and specifically my switching story. And I'm gonna focus kind of on three areas. And that is what were the conditions on the PC that made it unfavorable and why I would want to switch? What were the conditions on the Mac that made it favorable and why I would want to switch? And also the kind of cost associated with switching, kind of the barrier to actually making the switch and the real world consequences of switching. So that's really it this week. It's gonna be a chill, relaxed chat. But of course, first, we're gonna to need to make ourselves a drink. So for today's drink, we're gonna be making a lampshade. We're gonna start with one and a half ounces of gin. Then we're gonna add three quarters of an ounce of sweet vermouth. This recipe actually has us doing a 50-50 mixture of Martini and Rossi, three eighths of that, and another three eighths of Antica. So there's our three quarters of an ounce of sweet vermouth. Then we're gonna do a half ounce of Chinar. And finally, a quarter ounce of dry curacao. So we're gonna mix all that in our mixing glass. And then we're gonna strain it, although <laughs> don't know how useful that is, over a glass of ice. And finally, an orange peel for garnish. There we have a lampshade. Cheers. There's a lot of interesting flavors going on. Anyway, let's talk about Max. I wanna start things off by talking about what the conditions were on the PC in my life at the time that I decided to make the switch to the Mac. Now, I was a hardcore PC person. Um, I was in film school at the time and Anytime someone would be in a post-production facility where they had Macs, I would always scoff and be like, let's get a PC. You're wasting your money on this thing. Why would you do a Mac? Now, um, I had been working on my own out of college for one year uh, at the time that this iMac G4 was announced. In that time, in that year that I was working, a couple of things happened um, that made me start to want to consider uh, switching to the Mac. I worked at a production facility where it was me and another editor, and we were the only two people there editing, and the other editor didn't really know a lot about computers. And he was on a um, Adobe Premiere system, and I was on a discrete edit system. Um, and the discrete edit system was far more stable than the Adobe Premiere system. Uh, and so I could work pretty much all day on my discrete edit system and not really have too many issues. The other editor being less used to computers would forget to save, um, would have four or five pretty big crashes a day in which we would have to like go back and he'd have to redo work. And because he was less familiar with Windows, my job was spent a lot of the times troubleshooting, helping him troubleshoot, and also training him on the computer, which are both things that took away from me doing the job that I was supposed to be doing, which was doing editing and motion graphics. So that became very frustrating. Now, on its own, that would have been fine. That wouldn't have been enough to make me even consider switching. But when I would go home at night, I would go home to the PC that I had built, and I had two roommates, and I had built them PCs, and, uh, and those computers would always have issues. So then I was troubleshooting my computer, which would have an outdated driver or something weird with it or something just wasn't compatible. And, and also this was right before broadband, <laughs> uh, at least in the area that I lived. So uh, getting drivers and things like that was kind of a pain uh, because we're still on dial up. And the roommates computers would have issues and I'd be troubleshooting their computers. And um, I remember Windows XP came out in October of 2001, and I was like, finally. They took all the great stuff from Windows 2000, which I used on my work computer, and I was like, they rolled it into an operating system, and it's gonna be so great. Now, of course, any OS, especially Windows, at the beginning is gonna be uh, unstable, and so 
I went and, you know, got XP and expected it to be the savior of all things, and it just wasn't. Um, it was still uh, buggy. A lot of the stuff that I had uh, didn't have updated drivers for Windows XP at the time yet, and so I was still kind of having the same issues. And, you know, just general slowdown, just, I would just come home, want to relax from the stressful day at work of troubleshooting computers, and then I had to troubleshoot computers. The other, uh, uh, the other huge thing, again, related back to work was anytime we had an issue, there was four different areas that could be the problem. So it could be the hardware vendor, it could be the operating system vendor, it could be the driver vendor, and then it would be the, the end software that you're using. So in that case, like Adobe, so Adobe Premiere. So you had four different people that could be the problem, all kind of pointing fingers at each other. So it was very hard to get a lot of stuff troubleshot um, unless you had, you know, very expensive uh, licenses, which the place I was working was a very kind of small, <laughs> small operation. And so they didn't really have the money to have like really big IT uh, budget or any IT budget because I was the IT. So those were kind of the conditions, the frustrations that I was dealing with with the PC on the daily basis at the time that the iMac G4 was announced. So the things that made the Mac compelling to me uh, kind of increased over that year of 2001 into early 2002. And a lot of that was because that's when I started to collect vintage computers. So one of the first vintage computers that I ever purchased was the original Macintosh. That was in 2001. And I used it and it worked just like a computer that you would have had in the time worked. And it was just like, this computer's so old and it works exactly like they do now and other computers that I've used from that era don't. And that was intriguing. So one of the later computers that I got from my collection was the original iMac. Now at this time, it would have been three, three and a half years old when I got it. And it was intriguing because coming from the PC world at that time, a PC two years old was usually so sluggish that it was almost unusable. And so I had this iMac from that was three and a half years old and I remember using that and going, wow, this still runs pretty decently. It ran almost anything that I wanted to do like at a decent pace. And now it wasn't as fast as the PC that I had built, but like it was pretty good. So those are the two things that kind of had me go, hmm, like I'll look at this side of the aisle that I had never looked at before. And then of course, the the, the computer that I ended up getting, the, the computer that I ended up switching for was the iMac G4. And that was announced on January 7th, 2002. That computer was just so cool looking and all of the PCs just were not cool looking. And I know they like tried to adopt like the old G3 iMac design by just adding translucency to it, which was just not good design. It just was ugly. But like that was kind of like the PCs, like we're gonna make it cooler. Um, and, and being someone who made my own computers, uh, the case manufacturers just, at least what I could find were just not good looking. And I wanted something that looked cool. I wanted something that matched the aesthetic that I was trying to present in my house. The things that made me really look at the, the Mac were, were a couple of things. So one was you have one vendor for the computer, the operating system, and the software. Two was uh, Apple had the super drive, which was their DVD burner. Um, but they also had the software to back up the super drive. They had DVD Studio Pro and they had iDVD. Um, the PC at the time just had kind of consumer grade uh, DVD software or very pro grade DVD software. The other thing that was really compelling about the Mac at the time was of course, they were doing OS X. It was, it was the first year of rolling out OS X and it wasn't the first boot on the machines, but they were starting to install it and it was completely new and cool looking and just modern and the OS just made you want to use it. Uh, and I remember really being attracted to that part of it. So three, oh, uh, new OS, right? And it's Unix based. Um, and then <laughs> finally, as superficial as it, uh, as this is, one of the other things that made the Mac really compelling was 
the iPod. The iPod came out in late 2001 and it was Mac only. So wanting to use this device was also a reason like, oh, I should at least have a Mac around so that I can get music onto this iPod because that would just be cool. So those are the things that at the time that made the Mac compelling. So January 7th, 2001, Apple announces the iMac G4. Um, I find out about it, I think that day, maybe the next day, um, but it was like in blogs and it was just like the, the information and like very few pictures. I think they posted the quick time like the next day or maybe it was later that day of, of the full uh, Mac world. Uh, Worst Jobs announced it. Um, so I remember watching that and being very intrigued and the way I justified it because of my identity being so tied up and being a PC man was that I was gonna get this computer and it was gonna be the music computer and I was gonna put it in my kitchen and I would use it to put songs onto an iPod and that was my justification. And that's how, how I kind of announced it to my roommates at the time. I was like, hey, I'm getting this computer to put in the kitchen. It's the music computer, right? And uh, kind of not mention that it's a Mac, but also like aesthetically it matched the style that I had in the kitchen. And so it looked cool and I thought it would, would be an awesome Thing. So that was kind of the thing that intrigued me about it. So I ordered it and while I was waiting It took a while to get to me. I didn't get it till late February So it took almost two months to get to me. And so while I was waiting, I remember I ordered OS 10 and I ordered OS 10 so I could install this on the Bondi Blue iMac that I had from from collecting uh, Just so I could test it out because I was just so intrigued uh, to <laughs> to play with it and to see kind of what it was about. And of course, as I keep waiting, I keep wanting more things that will like kind of get that Mac closer to me. So the next thing I ordered was The Sims because I hadn't ordered it on the PC yet. I hadn't played it on the PC yet. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna get this. Why not get it for this computer that I have, this Bondi Blue iMac. So I got The Sims and then I got The Sims Living Large expansion pack and The Sims House Party expansion pack. So those are kind of the things that I did in the meantime as I was waiting for the iMac. Now I'm gonna talk about the actual cost of switching to the Mac. And shockingly, I still have my original invoices from when I ordered it and <laughs> all the information. So I can run you through the numbers of what it costs to switch to the Mac. All right, you ready? So the first thing that I wanna say is that my first new Mac was an iMac and it wasn't a bigger power Mac. And that is because I had to get all the other things that went with a Mac at the time. And so I couldn't get the, like, the biggest, best, nicest computer that I wanted. I had to get this, the biggest, best home computer that I wanted in order to kind of get my foot in the door and make that transition. And the reason is this, so, right? So the, <laughs> The computer itself before tax was $2,098. Now, $2,098 was because I upgraded it to have 512 megabytes of RAM. It was the 800 megahertz model. It had the super drive, which was the thing that I was really interested in from a video perspective. It had the external speakers, as you can see here, and then it had a, the 60 gigabyte hard drive. So it was fully maxed out. So we're talking about $2,098 for the computer itself. At the time, that's kind of what you would expect to pay for a higher end home PC, uh, not like a decked out gaming rig. Now, the first piece of software that you would need on your PC or on your Mac would be Office programs to be able to open Office documents. Now, uh, at the time, OpenOffice, I don't even know if I was aware of OpenOffice or if it even existed at the time yet, but the, the word processor that came with the Mac actually shipped on it is AppleWorks. And AppleWorks would, you know, kind of open a Word doc, but not really anything else. If you had an Excel file or a PowerPoint, it just couldn't do it. And uh, Pages and Numbers and Keynote hadn't been invented yet. So you're kind of at the mercy of Microsoft. So I had to get Microsoft Office for Mac. Now, Microsoft Office for Mac, I paid $459.95 for this, right? 
which is insane. Like most people don't even really get an office program anymore. They just use, you know, Google Docs or whatever. But $459.95 for Microsoft Office. So already to get into the door of the Mac, just a computer and a word processor, we're at $2,557.95. Insane. <laughs> so then, because I'm also trying to use this as a video machine, I want to do some video things. The video things that I wanna do, of course, are edit video and make DVDs. So the first thing that I got or ordered was Final Cut Pro 3 because this was becoming a, a force kind of to be reckoned with in the video production world. So Final Cut Pro 3, sure. Now, luckily my sister was still in college and I got an education discount on it through her. And so I only had to pay $2.99 for Final Cut Pro 3. Excellent. I believe the full retail was $9.99. In addition to that, because I had the super drive, because I was interested in making DVDs and authoring them, I went ahead and got DVD Studio Pro. So DVD Studio Pro was $499, and that is with the academic discount, because it also was $999 normally. So the cost that I paid with the education discount, so Mac, Office, Final Cut, DVD Studio Pro, now we're at $3,355.95. All of this is before tax and shipping. So in addition to computer and office and getting the editing software that they have on the, on the Mac, I also had to get uh, the Ether video software that I would use, which would be After Effects and Photoshop. Now, the same is true from Office is you couldn't upgrade your version on a PC to the version on the Mac or what they call a cross grade. You had to buy the full version again if you were buying it on a different platform. That was just the way it was done. So I had to full on rebuy Photoshop and After Effects for the Mac. So I've got my After Effects version 5.5 production bundle and my Photoshop version seven. And if I look at my receipts, I can see that I paid $1,699 for After Effects and $650 for Photoshop. $650 for Photoshop. That's just so insane. And so <laughs> now, the cost of switching to the Mac, because of all this software that I had to get, is now $5,704.95. Just bonkers. Now, because I wanted to have fun with it as well, I went ahead and got the iPod. The iPod was $399, so we'll add that to the cost. So, okay, $399 for an iPod. Of course, I had Sims already, so I'm not gonna count that one, but I paid $29 to get Age of Empires because this was my jam at the time and I loved Age of Empires 2, Age of Empires 2. Um, and also, because if I'm ultimately making the switch, if this computer is becoming my main computer and something comes up, I'm gonna need to open up something that I can't open up on the Mac, I went ahead and had to get virtual PC. Now, in reality, I probably didn't need to get virtual PC. The Mac was a little bit more suited at cross-platform compatibility than I was expecting, but at the time, just to be safe, went ahead and got that too. So with those last couple of things, with my iPod, my Age of Empires, and my virtual PC, so iPod 399, Age of Empires 2995, virtual PC, $209.95. The total cost that I spent in the month of January 2002 in order to switch to the Mac was $6,343.85. And only a third of that was the computer. 
Now, admittedly, a ton of that was in After Effects, um, but you know, that was the nature of my job and I'm sure other people at the time had jobs or things that they would have to buy specialized software to, for as well. So, was everybody paying $6,343.85 in order to switch to the Mac? No, but that's how much it cost me to switch to the Mac because of what I was doing. Now, shortly after, they made a lot of that stuff easier. Um, Microsoft introduced a version of Office that was the home user version, which gave you, I think, licenses for three Macs and it was like $150. Obviously, also, Apple came out with Pages and Numbers and Keynote, which are way more compatible with Office than they had been, and that just made it a lot easier. Also, shortly after I made my switch to the Mac, one of the biggest costs about switching to the Mac actually became a lot cheaper, and that was Adobe introduced cross-grade upgrade licensing. And that was, if you had a version of After Effects or, or Photoshop on the PC and you wanted to switch to the Mac, all you had to pay was that upgrade license fee and they would allow you to switch that license over, which obviously that made it a lot easier uh, to, to switch to the Mac and a, a ton cheaper. I mean, again, that was a, a third of my cost of upgrading was just in those two pieces of software from Adobe. Now, of course, you have Creative Cloud and you just install it on the other computer. You get licenses, I think, on three computers and they could be any mix or match of Macs and PCs. I will say from a collector standpoint, that's part of the reason why I don't have a lot of stuff from a certain era. And that was in order to finance this, I had to sell all the PC stuff. You know, I sold my copy of Photoshop. I sold the games that I had for the PC. I sold the PC itself and all the hardware that it had. So it didn't sit around in a closet somewhere where I could kind of keep it. Uh, I ended up having to sell all of that to help to finance the Switch, which, you know, made it a little bit easier. Um, also, my coworker, whose computer I had to troubleshoot, he ended up switching, they ended up switching, the work ended up switching him to a Mac because it was more stable and they could, get more work done in a day. They didn't have to, I didn't have to go and troubleshoot so I could get more work done. His computer wasn't crashing, so he got his work done. So at the time, um, it was a very risky move to spend so much money to, to try this thing out, but uh, I think it ended up working out really uh, for the best. I would say the only way in which it really suffered is I don't know a lot about PC gaming from that era. So anyway, so I kind of went through the situation on PCs and why I'd want to switch, why the Mac seems so compelling to switch, and of course, the actual cost of what I paid in order to switch, which is insane, and I'm glad I didn't add it up at the time, uh, <laughs> because I think it would have been a big deterrent, but... Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it's kind of a, a, a departure. I'm not doing anything super technical or even <laughs> super educational, I would say, but I just wanted to talk through kind of a more significant uh, part of my computing existence and actually switching platforms because it's not something I ever had to do. I was PC since the original IBM, as I've talked about. So switching to the Mac was a huge deal for me. And uh, yeah, anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. And I'll see you in the next one.